as many of you know, I'm always looking for new research. Not that we need to give more credence to what we're doing, but this is sort of like directly applicable to what we're doing. So I find it to be pretty, um, um, pretty relevant. Um, it came out of the VA. Uh, this was actually published August 19th, 2024. Um, and it's called Telehealth Mindfulness Based Interventions for Chronic Pain. Uh, an LAMP randomized clinical trial. Um, it was done um, from three different VAs in the nation, from um, VAs in Los Angeles, Minnesota, and Durham, North Carolina. I'm just going to read you the abstract because I, I feel like uh, it's pretty important. Um, although mindfulness-based interventions are evidence-based treatments for chronic pain and comorbid conditions, implementing them at scale poses many challenges, such as the need for dedicated space and trained instructors, which is which is which is really important, right? Um, two things: one is having a trained instructor of some sort, um, which can be helpful. The other one is actually having a space to practice it or to do it together. A lot of times people go on these, you know, mindfulness or meditation retreats. Um, they can be fairly expensive. Um, you know, they're, they're multi-day retreats. They can be fairly expensive. They do obviously provide food. Some provide food and shelter. So that's, that takes up a lot of the cost, but, um, they, you got to pay for the instructor, right? We've got to pay for the, um, the space, the instructor, et cetera, et cetera. We have the benefit here of um, having, um, you know, being able to do this for free, which is fantastic. Um, our CEO supports this, has continued to support this for now for five years, and uh, and so that's been that's been wonderful. We haven't had to charge anybody for this yet. Um, so what they wanted to do is, and this, you know, a lot of this was really sparked by COVID. So, you know, if you could see the uh, what actually what some of the good things that COVID brought um, was how do we transition to uh, being able to disseminate information, content, teaching um, without needing to be in person. And um, so a lot of mindfulness, a lot of sort of these sorts of trainings went online and they've continued online because they've noticed benefit. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to examine um, group and self paced uh, mindfulness-based interventions for veterans with chronic pain compared to usual care. So it was a randomized trial. Um, these were veterans who were in moderate to severe chronic pain, and they were recruited from three veteran facilities from November 2020 to May 2022, and then there was a follow-up in August 2023. So essentially right in the middle <laughs> right in the middle of the pandemic, essentially, right? COVID sort of hit in March of 2020, April of 2020, when we went into lockdown. And so we're, everybody was kind of trying to figure out what to do. So if you think of when they took these people from November, 2020 to May, 2022, um, they had two eight week telehealth mindfulness-based interventions. There was a group and a self-paced. Um, so there's two different two different options. It was a group, kind of like what we're doing, and then a self-paced were compared to usual care. The mindfulness-based intervention was done via video conference, also exactly how we're doing, um, but they had pre-recorded mindfulness education and skill training videos by an experienced instructor, and then it was accompanied by facilitated discussion. Okay. Um, the self-paced group was similar, but they completed the um, they completed the videos um, by themselves, and then they had uh, three individual facilitator calls. So imagine as if I gave you a um, if I gave you you know ten videos to watch or something like that, and then we would touch base via 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 phone and sort of review the videos or review the content. Okay. 
what they looked at was they looked at um, pain related function using a, a few different uh, scores. Uh, they looked at 10 weeks, six months, and one year. They also looked at other um, outcomes, including pain intensity, physical function, anxiety, fatigue, sleep disturbance, participation in social roles and activities, depression, patient ratings of improvement of pain, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so that's what they that's what they looked at. Um, and just in terms of the introduction, because I always I always like the way you know smart people write things. Chronic pain, a prevalent, debilitating, and costly national problem, disproportionately affects veterans. Although guidelines now recommend evidence-based non-pharmacological treatment approaches from for chronic pain, they are underused due to myriad barriers at the patient, clinician, and organization levels. Uh, Mindfulness-based interventions can improve chronic pain and comorbid conditions such as post-traumatic stress disorder, sleep disorders, depression, and substance misuse, and are now recommended as first-line treatment. However, many mindfulness-based interventions, including mindfulness-based stress reduction, one of the most widely adopted mindfulness-based interventions, have features that pose barriers to implementation. Uh, this pragmatic randomized clinical trial is part of a pain management collaboratory. Uh, the studies examine the effectiveness of two scalable telehealth approaches for delivering mindfulness-based interventions aimed at improving pain-related functioning and comorbid biopsychosocial conditions for veterans with chronic pain. Each mindfulness-based intervention was adapted from mindfulness-based stress reduction, and they addressed previously identified implementation barriers at the organization level, such as scalability and patient level time required for sessions and practice and accessibility. So when you're looking at, you know, when you're looking at, at scalability, being able to um, record things is obviously important so that uh, people can access them at any time, um, but also where the, the provider's time, for instance, whoever the, the skilled facilitator is or the provider is, doesn't necessarily need to be there in person. Um, so you're looking at, you know, ways of scaling it, but also accessibility. Uh, when we started this group, for instance, this was where people had to come to one room and we would turn on the zoom camera in one room and then and then we thought well why don't we just go into people's homes right if they have a computer why do they have to go to that room and can we just go to people's homes so that's um that's a that's a way that we tried to we tried to scale it okay what were the interventions right these are all these the things that we i like to i like to kind of look at right in detail whenever we've looked at prior clinical studies. I'm always interested in the interventions, right? What was actually done? Um, so they had a group mindfulness-based intervention, which consisted of eight 90-minute weekly. So once a week, right? Meeting for 90 minutes uh, and only eight times, only eight times um, sessions with between six and 16 participants, six and 16 participants. Right, so each group had six to 60, which I think is actually a really good number. Um, of course, that gets to the scalability question. Um, but, you know, once you get above 16, 20, 30, 40, and you're, you're leading a meditation, um, some people might get lost. Um, and so I think those are, those are good numbers. Uh, the sessions were delivered via secure video conferencing and preceded by a 90 minute technical session. So, you know, to help people log on if they need to, if they need help logging on. Um, the program consisted of educational and instructional videos presented by a trained certified mindfulness instructor. And um, the content focused on providing participants with opportunities and resources to develop their mindfulness and pain self-management capabilities and motivations. 
This included mindfulness related knowledge and skills in relating attention and emotion, establishing body awareness and shifting self perceptions considered essential content in mindfulness based interventions. So I hope when I read that a lot of that makes sense right and understanding thoughts emotions body awareness right things that we've practiced I think things that we've practiced here as well. Uh, <clears throat> in session video viewing was interspersed with workbook reflections and group discussions led by a trained facilitator. Participants were encouraged to practice on their own between sessions using a workbook, mobile application, and study website, which included the same videos presented in the group sessions. Um, so they had the videos, right? So we have um, YouTube channels that we refer to. Um, we've referred to a number of various uh, meditations, whether it's Deepak uh, Chopra, whether it's Thich Nhat Hanh or um, um, Sharon Salzberg, you know, whatever it might be, um, or going on and, and, and finding your own, you know, your own meditation that works for you on, on, uh, on YouTube. The self-paced mindfulness-based intervention arm consisted of eight 30 to 60 minute weekly sessions of the same curriculum and material as the group, but without group interaction. And they received three phone calls from a facilitator at the beginning, middle, and end of the program. Uh, these phone calls lasted 25 to uh, 60 minutes. And they looked at, um, they addressed technical and logistical issues, as well as discussed progress, plans for practice, and strategies to address challenges. Strategies to address challenges. Okay. Um, and then the uh, the the cell, the other the third group was essentially uh, care as usual. So they continued to receive care as usual. Every group received care as usual. So it's not like because you were getting the mindfulness um, inter intervention, the other care was stopping. Whatever that care might might have been. So if you were getting medications or you know receiving other care, physical therapy, et cetera, et cetera, you were getting that care as usual. Okay. What they found is, uh, so they, they, they enrolled um, 811 veterans, 811 with an average age of, uh, excuse me, a mean age, yeah, average age of 54.6 years. Um, 694 participants 694 participants, which is 85.6% actually completed the trial, which is a pretty good number for trial completion. Um, so even even with that, um, you know, a lot of times when you when you start a trial, there's an attrition, you lose people to follow up, um, people want to, you know, they want to quit the trial, or they don't like it or whatever it might be. Um, which is which is interesting. Uh, this had, in my opinion, a fairly high completion rate. Um, averaged across all three time points. So, um, the time points again were 10 weeks, six months, and one year. So, averaged across all three time points. Pain interference scores were significantly lower for both mindfulness based intervention groups compared to usual care. Additionally, both mindfulness based intervention arms had significantly better scores on the following secondary outcomes pain intensity, patient global impression of change, physical function fatigue, sleep disturbance, social roles and activities, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, let me, let me, let me, um, let me repeat that. All right, across all three time points. So that was 10 weeks, um, 
after, six months after, and one year after. Okay. There was um, pain interference scores were significantly lower for both mindfulness based interventions compared to usual care. Also, both mindfulness based intervention arms had significantly better scores on pain intensity, patient global impression of change, physical function, fatigue, sleep disturbance, social roles and activities, depression, and post traumatic stress disorder. All right. That's huge. <laughs> That's really huge. Okay. If I gave you, if I had a medication that did that, you'd all be on it. This would, um, there would be politicians who would argue that this needs to be in the drinking water because it, the benefits are so good from it. All right. Um, it goes on to say, uh, both group and self-paced mindfulness-based interventions did not significantly differ from one another. Okay. The probability of 30% improvement from baseline compared to control was greater at 10 weeks and six months for the group mindfulness-based intervention and for the self-paced mindfulness-based intervention at all three time points. So the probability of a 30% improvement from a baseline compared to control right, for the group mindfulness-based intervention at 10 weeks and six months and for self-paced mindfulness-based intervention at all three time points. Okay, at all three time points. What we recommend, right, is a group and a self-paced. We actually recommend, I recommend both, right? We do the group. And then I recommend go out and do the practice, right? Do your self-practice, continue doing your self-practice, okay? A 30% reduction from baseline at a year after doing this mindfulness-based intervention, all right? Anything that lasts that long, again, you would be on it. This medication would cost the $10,000 a pill. Okay. And um, your copay on it would be $500. Everybody would be on it. Maybe more. $1,000 copay. Okay. Now, 30% reduction, 30%. Why is that number? Why is that number so interesting to me? Um, we have a, we have a certain parameter that you we use when we prescribe medications okay uh, it's called the clinically meaning, meaningful improvement does the medication have a, a clinical meaningful improvement okay and um, in opioid medications when you prescribe an opioid medication the um, what has been sort of standardized determined is a, a clinical meaningful improvement of 30 percent Right. So what does that mean? Um, that means that if I prescribe an opioid medication, my goal for the treatment is at least 30% benefit. At least if I'm not getting 30% benefit, then I need to change my treatment plan. There needs to be, you know, we need to change the treatment plan. So a lot of times when people are starting on opioid medications, for instance, they feel like their pain is, you know, especially in chronic pain, they feel like their pain is seven, eight, nine out of 10, and they're being started on an opioid medication, and their hope and expectation is that this medication is actually going to take the pain down to zero, or one, or two, that happens very frequently. Okay. And so one of the things that we have to do as providers is educate the patient on, um, on a what a meaningful clinical improvement is on this medication, despite it being a very strong medication, okay, and having significant side effects. Um, and that most, more likely than not, that the pain will not come down to a zero or a one or a two, or even a three, right? That an, a, 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 a reasonable, that a reasonable goal for somebody 
who is at a pain level of let's say eight or nine out of 10 would be to decrease it down to five to six out of 10. Okay, that's your 30%, all right? In fact, that's a pretty good number to sort of like, if you're, you know, if, 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 if you are considering starting opioid medications, for instance, um, that the, you know, a good number to kind of like wrap your head around is, you know, I'm gonna get, I'm likely, I'm hoping to get 30% benefit or more from this medication. Now for mindfulness-based intervention studies to show 30% benefit over time, 10 weeks, six months, one year, right? That's the, that's the exact same benefit that you would expect on average from an opioid medication. Regardless of dose, <laughs> okay? Regardless of dose, right? We have some people who are taking, you know, 60, 90, 120, 150 milligrams of morphine. And guess what they report? Do you think they have a pain that goes from eight to zero out of 10? No. Okay. We clinically, we clinically feel good continuing that medication if that pain comes down to a five out of 10 from eight out of 10. We clinically feel like we can continue the medication, both legally, medically, whatever it might be, uh, if the pain comes down to a five out of 10, okay? So um, this, is, this is really, you know, this is really powerful because if interventions such as these, if these non-pharmacological interventions, right? that have very few side effects, very few side effects, okay, can provide even close to 30% benefit in not only pain, but in also all the other factors that they looked at, right? All the other attributes there, including right, your own global impression of change, how much, you know, how much do you feel like you, you something has changed? Physical function, fatigue, sleep disturbance, your social roles and activities, depression, and PTSD. Right? Not only am I looking at pain, okay, but all those other roles that have actually improved with a with a non pharmacological intervention that was supplied over eight weeks. Right, once a week, we do twice a week. Once a week, I recommend at least five minutes a day of practice. Okay, if you can do more, do more. Um, but what we recommend here is right a combination of sort of a group and and a and a self based. Right now, imagine that a group and self based. Okay, and see, and and if we um, we we haven't, I've done this. Uh, I've done this before. I sent a questionnaire out to some of the participants and asked, you know, compared to a year ago or two years ago, you know, if you've been with the if you've been with the program long enough, you know, compared to a year ago, how do you feel now? And 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 the results were pretty staggering. Pretty amazing. Okay. Um, so this just came out August 19th, 2024 out of three VAs, if you can find a good VA, they are really, they can be really good resources for vets. Um, it really depends on the VA, the quality can, can vary. Um, I was at the West Los Angeles VA for quite a number of years and um, the quality there is just outstanding. Um, they, they, they can sometimes get better care than Medicare, than PPO. Um, and, and it's just about really kind of finding the right the right clinic, the right clinicians, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, and, and, and they are, you know, they really, they really care about their veterans and, and they see the effects that war has that these, these traumatic situations have on people. And, you know, we need, they need to come up with treatments that aren't as, um, as side effect profiled as opioid medications for people with pain. 
And so it's not surprising that this come out, come out of the VA. A lot of good research comes out of the VA. Um, and, you know, to be able to pull three VAs together, um, fairly large one, including, you know, Los Angeles, uh, Minnesota, and North Carolina, um, and being able to do this, these, these sorts of studies is quite, is quite great. And, and we get to ride the coattails of the studies and the results and be able to talk about them and say, you know, here's another, here's another reason to continue the practice. Right? This is just another, it's another, it's another nail on the, on, on our, on our, on our door saying, yep, here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. Okay. Um, so with that, let's go into our practice for today. Okay, so let's find a comfortable posture. A posture you feel relaxed, yet alert. Closing your eyes if you feel comfortable closing your eyes. Or just having a soft downward gaze as if you're looking off on the horizon. as if the sun is setting over an ocean. And taking two or three deep breaths and with each in breath, allowing yourself to be ever so slightly more present in this moment. Allowing yourself to feel supported by the surface you're on, a chair, a couch, a bed, whatever it might be. And choosing to bring your attention in this practice to your resource, a place that you can direct your attention to that feels safer. And for this practice, directing your attention to this resource, this anchor. It may be a word or phrase or prayer. It may be a felt sense in the body. It may be an image, a picture, It may be the sensation of the breath or your focus on the breath. Whatever it is, this is where we are directing our attention to. And as we are directing our attention to this resource or anchor, notice what else comes up in your awareness that tries to pull your attention away. Subtle thoughts or emotions or sensations Try to grab your attention, pull it away. And 
And as your attention does get pulled away from your anchor or resource, simply recognizing that with kindness and love and coming back to your anchor. And as you're paying attention to your resource, your undivided attention, notice the peripheral awareness, the peripheral attention everything else that tries to come in that comes in almost as if they are shows on the side trying to peek in trying to get a little bit of space in your directed attention And for this practice, simply choosing not to direct your attention to those. That you have picked consciously a place to direct your attention And that is where your attention is going over and over and over and over again. Sustained, focused attention.
just noticing where your attention is if it has wandered from your anchor that's perfectly fine simply come back to what you choose to pay attention to consciously sustained focus one breath at a time one heartbeat at a time over and over again
Focusing your attention on your resource. With each breath, with each heartbeat, if your attention wanders or is pulled away, simply coming back. Just this moment. Focusing my attention just this moment, right now, right here, And as we bring this practice to a close today, simply recognizing how you may be able to use sustained, focused attention throughout your day to choose what you wish to pay attention to. And with that, taking two or three deep breaths, Opening your eyes, if your eyes were closed. Stretching or moving if you need to stretch. Just taking a moment to reflect on your practice today. <laughs>